Hello, welcome back. So we're now on to symmetry and skewness. And the only other thing we need to do in this class is kurtosis. So this should be a nice short class. So let's get started. So we're going to start with the symmetrical distribution. And this is one that's got the same shape on both sides of its mean. So if we look at the diagram down over here, we've got the mean of the distribution in the middle. And we can see that the shape of the distribution on the left is the same as the shape on the right. And we can see that we are measuring on the vertical axis the probability. So we can see that the probability of being below the mean is the same as the probability of being above the mean. And we can also see that there's a high probability here of being around the mean. And there's also a low probability of being over here way below the mean. And we call this one the left tail. And there's also a low probability out here of being way above the mean. And we call that the right tail. And also we can see that in the symmetrical distribution, the mean, the mean and the mode, they are all the same. And another thing about the symmetrical distribution, we can see it's got no skewness. So what then is skewness? So skewness is over here. It describes the degree to which, it with, to which a distribution is not symmetric about its mean. So here we've got no skewness. So we're now going to look at the skewness on the next slide. So just before we get going with the skewness, there's a bit of good news. We don't have to know any calculations for this. You may have seen in the books that there's some ugly looking formulas for skewness. We don't have to be concerned about those. So if a distribution has got skewness, it can either be negatively or positively skewed. So let's start with negatively skewed first. I'm gonna start with this block over here. So a distribution with a negative skew, it has got a few large losses, which are our outliers and frequent small gains. So let's start with a few large losses or the outliers and explain what's going on here. And I'm gonna use an example that was in the previous CF Institute book. It's not in the current book. So in the, in the previous book, they gave an example of a distribution of returns of shares on a stock market in America. And included in that distribution of returns of the shares was the year 2008. Now you, might, you may be aware that 2008 was the year of the global financial crisis. So the stock market had a terrible year in that year. I think it was down 30 or 40%. And I think altogether they had about uh, 10 years of returns in the, in the distribution. So that one bad year, it was, it was, there was a one large loss there. So that caused the distribution to look like this, where, the, where this left tail is being pulled to the left by that one large loss. But we can see it says there are few large losses, and that is tying up here, because remember, our probability is along the, um, along, along over here, along our vertical axis. So we can see, that there's a large loss because we weigh down over here. There's a large loss, but the probability of the large loss is very low. So there's only a, there's only a few large losses or outliers. But what we also need to know is that they, they, they are frequent small gains. So here are the small gains over here. And the probability of the small gains are high because there's our probability. So I've seen questions where they've or practice questions where they've said to us, in a negatively skewed distribution, there are many large losses. Well, that's wrong. There's only a few large losses over here. Um, and sometimes they say there are a few small gains. No, there are frequent small gains like we can see over there. So this, what we need to focus on now is what's the most, most affected by the outliers. And we actually know this from one of our previous classes. The mean that is most affected by the outliers. So our, in our example of the distribution of returns on the stock market, that one bad year's return 
will cause the mean to be pulled down. So the mean is going to be the lowest out of the median and the mode. So the mean is uh, yeah, the lowest out of the median and the mode. So it makes sense that the, the mode is, the, is, is sticking out here the highest. Because why? Because the mode is just the number that occurs most frequently, like we know. So if they tell us on the exam, for example, maybe they tell us the mean of a distribution is four, uh, the median is five, and the mode is six. Well, then we must immediately recognize that this is a negatively skewed distribution because the mean is the one that's most affected and it's being pulled down. And we must, it's easy to remember the median is over here because the median, we can always view it, you know, as the one in the middle, as we know. So that then makes perfect sense. So the positively skewed one, this is now the exact opposite. So now we've got a few large gains again, um, or outliers. And now we've got the opposite. Now we've got frequent small losses. So a, a scenario like this, where we, where we could get a distribution like this, if we stick with our previous example of distributions of returns on the stock market, let's say we've got returns over 10 years. And in one of the 10 years, the stock market does fantastically well. Let's say it's up 50% or something like that. So there we've got one large gain. And that then is going to do what to the mean? That is going to cause the mean to be most affected. So the mean is going to be the greatest out of the mode, the median and the mean. The mean is going to be the highest. So we can see over here again, there we've got a large gain. Over here, there's a large gain, but there's only a few of them. The probability of getting this large gain, we can see, is very very low indeed right and we but we can but what we can also see is that there are frequent small losses so here are our small losses but there's many of them right so there's frequent small losses okay so don't don't we mustn't get caught on the exam we if they tell they, if they say to us they in a positively skewed distribution there are many large gains we must say no that's a wrong answer there's only a few large gains and if they say to us there are a few small losses no they, they are frequent they are frequent small losses okay so if that, let's just do an example then. Uh, let's say the mode is now six. It's just the number that's occurring the most. Um, the, the median, let's say, for example, is seven and the mean is eight. So there we've, if they give us a scenario like this, where the mean is the biggest, the mean is the biggest number over here. So that's eight, the median here is, so there we've got seven for the median. Uh, the mean over there is eight and the mode is over here, six. If they tell us something like that, then we must immediately, immediately recognize that this is positively skewed because the mean is the one that's most affected. So we say that the mean, it's pulling this tail now to the right. Great. And now we're going on to kurtosis. It's a bit of a funny word, this, isn't it? So what, what is kurtosis? It measures the combined weight of the tails of a distribution relative to the rest of the distribution. So we're going to start over here with a mesocurtic distribution. So the mesocurtic distribution has got the same kurtosis as a normal distribution. So we're going to be talking a lot about the normal distribution in many classes to come, which is going to be in the next study session. But this is our normal distribution over here, the one that is in the middle of the three. And remember what kurtosis is, it's just the weight of the tails relative to the rest of the distribution. So there's our, there's our left tail over there. And here is our right tail over here. So we've got how much of the distribution is in the tails over here. There's the, there's the, there's the, the weight of the tails here 
relative to the rest of the distribution is over there. Right, so now what we need to do is compare this mesocurtic one of the normal distribution to the leptocurtic and to the platocurtic. So let's start then with the leptocurtic. So we can see that this leptocurtic one, it's got fatter tails than the normal distribution, and it's also more peaked. So it's got it's more peaked over here. So kurtosis is then also a measure of peakedness. So if we see that the, the tail now of the leptocurtic, if we just draw its tail in over there and over here, we can see that the leptocurtic distribution, it's got fatter tails, right? So there is more area in the tail here of the leptocurtic compared to our normal distribution. Normal distribution is only from there to there. And the same in this tail, there's more area under the tail here for the leptocurtic compared to our normal distribution over there. So what is the, the, the big deal about this? Well, if there are fatter tails, like we've said, there's more air in the tails. And what does that mean? That means there's more risk because if, you've, if, you've, if there's more air in the tails over here, there's more chance that you can get these outliers over here. So this means that there's, there's a higher probability of getting these large losses. So there is then more risk in the leptocurtic distribution. And the way I like to remember the, the, the leptocurtic distribution is if we think of rugby and there's a line out, you know, the, the lock forward is the one who, who, who leaps up to catch the ball in the line out. So that's leptocurtic. So the leptocurtic distribution is leaping up above the normal distribution. I used to always use Victor Matfield, but now he's retired many years ago. So maybe we'll have to think of using somebody else. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's just a bit of fun. And then the last, the, the other one we need to look at is the platocurtic one. And this platocurtic one we can see is flat. So if you know Afrikaans, it's very easy because flat in Afrikaans is plat. Right, so there we go. It's a plat, it's a flat, this is the flat curve. So we can see it's, it's a very flat one compared to the normal distribution. So if it's flat like this, it's gonna have thinner tails because the tail now for this, for this platocurtic one, the tails are here now, they are much, much, much thinner. We've only got the tails over here. We are making more of a mess. <laughs> yeah, so that is, uh, we got we now got the thinner tails there. We only got tails from there to there, not not from there to there anymore. So we got thinner tails than the normal distribution. And now we can also see that we are less peaked because it's flat, it's plat. <laughs> okay, so that takes care of that. Now the last thing we need to look at in this class is excess kurtosis. So remember the good news, <laughs> we don't have to do any calculations for kurtosis or for skewness. So when we look at excess kurtosis, we just got to know one or two numbers, we, we don't have to ever calculate them. So the value of kurtosis for a normal distribution is three. It's just a, it's just a statistical fact. So let's just remember what kurtosis is. I just want to go back one sec. It, it, it measures the combined weight of the tails of a distribution relative to the rest of the distribution. So for the normal distribution, the kurtosis is three. So the three just means it's the weight of these tails here relative to the rest of the distribution, which is this part over there. Right, so that is all the kurtosis is. So we just need to know that the value of kurtosis for the normal distribution, for this one over here, the one in the middle, the blue one, is three. And to measure excess kurtosis, we need to take the kurtosis of whatever distribution they give us, whatever sample kurtosis they give us, we just need to take that and subtract three, and that's gonna give us the excess kurtosis. 
So let's try these examples and we'll see that it's nice and easy. So let's start with the leptokurtic distribution. So let's say they tell us on the exam, the distribution has got, this has got kurtosis of five. So what would the excess kurtosis then be? To work out excess kurtosis, we just take its kurtosis, which is five, it, its sample kurtosis is five, they gave us that. And to work out the excess, we just subtract the three. So the excess kurtosis is going to be two for this distribution. And then what about the mesokurtic or the normal distribution? Well, we've said above that a normal distribution has got kurtosis of three. So to work out the excess, we take its kurtosis of three and we always subtract three to work out excess kurtosis. So this means that the normal distribution has no excess kurtosis. But what about the flat one, the platykurtic one? So let's say they tell us on the exam, we've got a distribution and it's got kurtosis of one. So what is it? What is its excess kurtosis? We just got to subtract three. So that's going to give us excess kurtosis of minus two. So lastly, if the excess kurtosis in absolute value is more than one, that is considered significant. So remember absolute value, we just ignore, if there's a minus sign, we just ignore it. So let's look at our examples. Is this distribution and this one, are they, is this kurtosis significant or is it not significant? Well, for, the, for this distribution, this leptokurtic one that we had, the value was more than two, yes. So it is significant. And, and what about this one? This platykurtic one, its excess kurtosis is minus two. So remember, in absolute values, we must ignore the minus signs. So let's make it a positive. So two is now it's greater than one. So this one is then is also significant. So both of these guys are considered significant uh, kurtosis, right? Or, or, or significant excess kurtosis. Good. So that's the end then of that class. So it, we'll see you guys then in the next one. Hello, it's Tim here again. I hope you enjoyed the class and found it beneficial. We have some classes available for free on YouTube, but we have classes for the entire curriculum. The classes that are not on YouTube can be purchased from us. If you'd like to purchase the classes, please contact us for the pricing. And I've put our contact details over here. You can purchase all the classes or certain readings that you would like. When you purchase the classes, we provide you with the slides and our notes. I've assisted hundreds of candidates pass CFA exams, and I look forward to also helping you through the CFA program. I've put in two testimonials in the slide over here, and we also have a testimonials page at, on our website that you can review. I look forward to seeing you soon, and all the best.